I feel like I need to start off the sermon by saying, let's go, right? That was exciting. The last service, we celebrated a baptism together. Uh, Bailey, God's on the move. God is working. Our series is called Movement. Uh, I want us to, to observe, I want us to see God on the move. That's actually what this series is all about, seeing the handprint of God, seeing the fingerprints of God, seeing the hand of God at work in the lives of his people, okay? Um, Hey, just another welcome to you if you're visiting with us. We're glad that you're here. Uh, We're glad you're worshiping with us uh, here or online. My name's Stephen. I'm one of the pastors here. Uh, Grateful to, to continue in worship, all right? That was awesome, but we're continuing to worship uh, as we open God's word, okay? Genesis 12 is where we'll be. Uh, As I mentioned, this is now, this is week two of our movement series, all right? A series that's all about seeing the hand of God at work in the lives of his people in the Old Testament and moving forward. So that includes us, seeing the hand of God at work in our lives. Um, and we're going to do that by looking at Genesis 12 and, and observing a, a small beginning, all right? A small beginning to see where this whole story came from. It is the story of God. So Genesis chapter 12, you can be turning there. As you do, um, I'm going to take you back in time to another millennium, all right? Ancient history, uh, 1994, all right? <laughs> That's what my kids think is ancient history. So, 1994, there's a guy uh, having a conversation with some colleagues at his place of work, and he was, he was throwing out ideas on, on how he could make money um, utilizing this, this new thing called the Internet, all right? Kids in here, there were people alive before the Internet, all right? We survived. It was great. Uh, but he's, he's trying to figure out, man, what can I do to, to make money off of the Internet? So he throws out all these ideas, and eventually he says, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to sell books. I'm going to sell some books online. And everybody thought that was silly and crazy. You can just go to the store to get a book, right? But he said, oh, I'll, I'm going to sell some books. So he compiled an inventory of books in his own garage at his house and registered a, a URL link, relentless.com. All right, Relentless.com. You can go there if you want to. And it will uh, direct you somewhere else, though. Most of you have actually bought something off of Relentless.com. Did you know that? Jeff Bezos went on to sell more things than just books. Relentless.com became Amazon.com. You can still go to Relentless.com today. It's still registered. But it takes you to Amazon, right? It takes you to a company that's now worth over $300 billion in revenue a year. Right, what started in his garage, what started as this crazy outlandish idea, eventually became our country's largest retailer. Employs over a million people. I mean, the story of Amazon is epic by our standards. Small beginning, unassuming potential, billion dollar company. Unbelievable. We love stories like that. We stand in amazement over stories like that. We love stories like Michael Jordan, right? Kid from Wilmington, North Carolina, grows up, gets cut cut from his high school basketball team at Laney High, then goes on to be a Tar Heel. Any Tar Heel fans? There we go. And then, arguably, the greatest basketball player of all time. We love that story, right? We love that, man, he thought his, his basketball career was over in high school, but man, he became the greatest of all time. We stand in amazement. This morning, church, as we continue in our movement series, we start with a really small beginning. We start with, in a story with That seems like it has no potential. In fact, God sets it up to look like it has no potential. But this story is far more amazing than any startup company that's far more complex than Facebook or Amazon or Google or Apple, right? It is far more intricate. The story that we look at is a story that could only be written and accomplished by God himself. This is the story of of God, a story of God calling a people to himself, forming a nation through Abram, and through that nation would come a Messiah, and through that Messiah would come salvation, the story of God. Last week, Lyle laid the foundation for us, right, in Zechariah. Zechariah 4, 6 is the kind of the theme uh, for us, where it says, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, declares the Lord. This series is all about seeing the hand of God move his promises forward. It's about seeing us as a church that is mobilized by the spirit of God, not our might, not our power. We want to observe and see and participate in the spirit that moves his people. So Genesis 12, like I said, is where we'll be. But before we begin reading, I want to see where we've 
we've kind of dropped ourselves in at in the book of Genesis. You, you'll read in the first 11 chapters of Genesis and you'll notice that the author mentions generation after generation. I mean, many, many generations go by. But then you get to 12 where we're at and he really, really slows down the pace. So from 12 to 50, the end of the book, there's only four generations that are mentioned, right? Uh, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, uh, and Jacob's son, Joseph. He slowed way down. Why is he slowing down? Why only four generations in all those books? Because he wants us to slow down. That's the point. He wants us to see that when we look back at this story, it's not about Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. It's about the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. He wants us to see the hand of God at work in every single line throughout the rest of this story. So he slows us down. That's what we're doing. We're slowing down. We're observing. We're looking at the hand of God at work. Okay? So... Back up with me to verse 29 of chapter 11. That's where we're actually going to start. 29 of chapter 11. Read with me. All right, it says, And Abram and Naor took wives. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Naor's wife, Milcah, and the daughter of Haran, excuse me, the daughter of Haran, uh, the father of Milcah and Ishka. Verse 30. Now Sarai was barren. She had no child. Why would the author include this? Why even pause and mention it? Because in a minute, we're going to be introduced to a promise that God gives to Abraham that is completely dependent upon the multiplication of generations. It's completely dependent on reproducing generations. Yet he he prefaces this promise by saying, Sarai can't have children. Why? So that when we look back at this story, we don't see Abraham. We don't see Sarah. We see the God of Abraham, the God of Sarah. We see a God who moved his promise forward, not by might, not by strength, not by power, but by his spirit. By the way, he'll go on to do this with uh, Isaac's wife, Rebecca. She was barren. Jacob's wife, Rachel. She was barren. So this promise that's completely dependent upon reproducing generations starts off with three women who can't even have children. This is the story of God. This is how he sets the stage. It looks like nothing could ever come from this small beginning. Yet it's an epic story like no other. So jump down to verse 1 of chapter 12. All right, it says, Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will uh, make you a great nation. And I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the world of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went as the Lord had told him. And Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. All right, so those four verses right there are the acorn that produces eventually the massive oak tree. This is the small beginning. Our aim is to see God's hand at work in this small beginning and in the beginnings and of our own life. And it starts with a call. It starts with a call. We worship a God who calls. So let's, let's address that for a moment. Uh, when I was a kid, I would always ask myself the question, what is God calling me to do? Right To the point where it was just on repeat in my mind. What's God calling me to do? What do I need to go do for God, right? And and I had all these interests, and so I would say, okay, well, maybe it's this, right? Maybe I am supposed to be a baseball player, right? Figured out quickly. That's not it, all right? Uh, I wanted to be a pilot, you know? I wanted to be an actor. Uh, If you ask my three-year-old daughter what she wants to be, she'll say she wants to be a Gigi. She loves her Gigi, her grandma. That's what she wants to be when she grows up. So you got to be a mama first, but... (laughs) but... But maybe you ask that question. Maybe you've asked that question in the past, or you're asking it now. What is God calling me to do? It's not a bad question. But it can be a dangerous question if it's our first question. If we lead with that question, it can be dangerous. Because there is a calling that precedes that one. There is a calling that precedes your directional calling. And it is your identity calling. Before God ever calls you to do anything or go anywhere, he has called you to himself. Before he has ever commanded you to go, he first and foremost called you to himself, which means your calling is not based on what you do. It's based on who you are. Your calling is not based on what you can go and do for God. It's based on who you are in Christ. 
So we don't have to go work for his promises. We work from his promises. You don't have to go work for the status of child of God. You work from the status of child of God. See, in our context, we are so uh, obsessed with this idea that our career, our job, is our identity. For many of us, that's where we find our worth, our validation. That's how we prove to the world we can do it, we can make it. And so that's why we lead with that question. God, what are you calling me to do? Right? Because that's where our, our identity is. Which means we think we have to answer that question in order to have value in order to have validation, in order to be approved. It's in the things that we do, and that's what we've done. We've substituted calling with career or status or, or whatever, and we've made calling about what we do and not who we are. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. First and foremost, you are a child of God. You work f- from that status, not for that status. When God forms a nation from Abram, he forms a people For his own possession. A people to call his own. Their identity is in God. He did not form a company. He did not take in resumes. He did not look at qualifications. He formed a people who would be known by him. That was their identity. That's where we start. A place of identity. We'll go back in time again. Ancient history. 1994 again. It's a good year. In my home we watch a lot of Disney movies. I like to go to the ones that I grew up on. My favorite one's Lion King. Lion King came out in 1994. There's a scene at the, toward the end of the movie where you know, Simba is now living on the outskirts of town, so to speak. He's been kind of uh, removed from his homeland. And he's living in shame. He's living in defeat, right? Because he thinks he's responsible for the death of his father. So he's kind of started this new life. Well, anyways, Nala comes along, the, the girl lion, and she says, Simba, you got to come back. Scar is a terrible leader. All the food is gone. We need you to come and be king. And he says, no, I, I can't. I can't go back there, right? He's defeated. He's living in condemnation, living in shame. But then there's this scene, right, where he encounters his father's spirit, Mufasa, right? You remember Mufasa kind of shows up in the sky. And Mufasa shows up, and he doesn't say to Simba, go back. Simba, come on, get it together. Go back. Do what you've got to do. He doesn't say that. You remember what he says? He says, Simba, you forgot. You have forgotten. You have forgotten who you are. And then he says, remember. Remember, Simba. You are my son. Remember. And if you grew up on that movie like me, you can just hear that, those rolling words. Remember, remember, remember. And he fades away, right? And that's what changes. That's what changed everything for Simba, right? That's the moment he said, oh, I'm going back. He runs back to Pride Rock, right, that night. Why? Not because his father told him to go do anything, but because he remembered that his status was child of the king, right? He was starting to work from that status, not for that status. He didn't need to go work for approval. He was working from approval. Your status begins with your identity. Your calling begins with your identity. You're a child of God. You're a son or daughter of the king. God did not call Abram to go accomplish anything. He called Abram to go so that God could accomplish through him. There's a difference. One's dependent on Abram, one's dependent upon God. And in this promise, Abrahamic covenant as we call it, God makes it all about what he can do. Notice five times he says, Abram, go to the land, I will show you. I will make you a great nation, Abram. I will bless you and make your name great. I will bless those who bless you. And him who dishonors you, I will curse. He takes it all upon himself. Right? Every step of the way, it's Abram relying on God. God is going to hold up this end of the deal by all conditions. We are a promise-driven people. We move forward not because we have to go and accomplish the promises, but because we get to uh, work from those promises. Abram was sent not to accomplish, but to abide. Not in his own might. This is not in his own power. This is of the Spirit of God, declares the Lord. So movement, guys, movement series, this all begins with identity. It all starts with your calling. Your primary calling as a believer is rooted in God drawing you to himself. And from that place of identity, we participate in his continuing 
plan of redemption. So rather than leaving here tonight thinking, or today thinking, I've got to go change the world for God, you can rest in the fact that God wants to change the world through you. And that happens by submitting to our calling, which is identity in Christ. So from there, God does issue a a directional calling, right? He calls you to himself, but then he sends us. To be a Christian is to live intentionally, is to live on mission. So there is a direction that God has for your life. So we move from this identity calling to this place of uh, directional calling. For Abram, his calling was to go, right? His identity was in the Father. His calling was to go, to leave behind the land of the familiar and go to the place, the land that God had for him, right? So when God calls us to himself, he then sends us. He redeems us and he relaunches us, right? Sometimes locally, sometimes internationally. For some of you, you will live your whole life on the mission field of Raleigh, and that's okay. For some of you, your calling, your directional calling is actually to stay where you're at. For some of you, it is international or it's another city. But for all of you, it's intentional. For all of us, our calling is intentional, and it always requires abandoning something, whether it's your hometown or a comfort that you find your identity in, you're called to deny yourself, take up your cross and follow Jesus. Why? It's not a very compelling invitation, but you can't follow Jesus if your value and identity is anchored in the things of this world. So our directional calling always leads us to a place of more dependency upon God, not less. Right? We're of the mindset that the older and more mature we get, we're more and more self-dependent. There's a reason Jesus invites the adults to be more like the kids, so that we can be more dependent on him. Your directional calling involves moving toward that place of more dependence, where your faith becomes more and more alive. I think one of the most tragic stories in the Bible is that of the rich young ruler. I'm thinking of the account in Matthew 19 where he says, what do I need to do to be saved? And Jesus says, this, this, and this. And he says, great, I've done that. He's a law law abider. He's a rule follower. But Jesus knows his heart. He knows his idols. He knows his God. So Jesus says to him, you sell everything too. And then you just, you witness the most tragic moment. He walks away, sorrowful. Because he was so attached to the things of this world, he couldn't abandon those things because they numbed him to the glory of God. They blinded him to the beauty of Christ. Don't find yourself in that spot where you're numb because of the comforts. Right? There's a reason Hebrews 12 tells us, deal with your sin, but also deal with your weights. When you run this race, you've got to address your sin, but you've also got to address your weights. What are the things that hold you back? Answer that one, right? What holds us back? What keeps us from pursuing in obedience this directional call on our life? When I look at Abram's situation, I see a man who could have easily given some legitimate excuses. That if he had come to me, you know, as his pastor, I would have maybe even said, yeah, that's, that's a little crazy. Yeah, I don't know if, I don't know if, that, if you should do that. That sounds dangerous. And it's like, why? Why do we do that to each other, right? God leads us in radical faith, and then we try to dumb it down for people. Abram could have had all the excuses in the world. Some of his excuses could be ours today. These are excuses, when I look at his life, I say, man, I I could have easily justified disobedience in this situation. First thing I notice is the obvious. He's 75 years old. He could have looked at God and said, I'm too old for this. I find myself saying that more and more often. My kids, man, they have infinite energy. It never drains. It never runs out. And I'm chasing them all around. And I find myself saying, I'm too old for this, right? Abram was 75. Why did God call a 75-year-old man to such a monumental task? The same reason he called a barren woman. So that when we look back at this story, we don't see Abraham's might or his power We see the Spirit of God overcoming every circumstance. Why did God lead his people to the edge of the Red Sea later in Exodus? So he could part it. 
so he could part it. So you don't look back and you say, wow, Moses did a great job. No, you look back and you say, God, the God of Moses did a great job. When people look at your life, when people look at our church, do they look and see the power of God at work? Do they see that it's clearly God that delivered you, that rescued you, that delivered you from exile and from slavery? Or are we walking in our own power, our own strength? This story is written so that we see God on the move and we participate in that movement. Our culture has this myth that when you're 65, you're done. You can coast, you can live for yourself. Scripture teaches no such thing. In fact, at retirement age, that might be the years that you can have the most impact for the kingdom of God with time and resources that you have more of. Don't let age be a restriction. This goes for the young and the old. Right? Age is not an excuse to justify disobedience. So Abram, clearly, he doesn't look at God and say, I'm too old for this. He moves in faith. The other thing, or you know, another obstacle or excuse he could have given was, God, this is very inconvenient. We are a people of convenience. This is not a new thing. All of humanity is kind of infatuated with convenience. But of all people, I think our culture is probably the most infatuated like, I, I won't even go to a Starbucks if it doesn't have a drive through you know? I'm like, get out of my car, are you kidding me? Like, it's ridiculous, right? We like convenience. Sometimes when we look at this story, we, we think, oh, uh, it was just Abraham with his backpack trekking along. No, this was massively inconvenient in every way. He had hundreds of herdsmen and servants, lots of family members, and cattle, and, sh- and, and food, right? And shelter, and possessions. I mean... God has essentially called him to mobilize an entire village. And Abram says, okay, tonight at 5 o'clock we'll have a couple share with us, Matt and Rachel Woods, who uprooted their family. They moved to Papua New Guinea, and they're going to share their calling with us tonight at 5 in the chapel. Um, I want you to come, and I want you to raise your hand and ask them, was that convenient? There he is. They're shaking their head. They're going to say, no, it wasn't convenient, but it was worth it. It's worth it. It's always worth following that directional call in your life. Convenience uh, is secondary to that. The call that God has on your life directionally is always worth it. It's always worth following in obedience. The other thing that Abram could have said, this is probably my default answer, and honestly, probably the biggest excuse uh, I see among Christians is he could have looked at God and say, and said, It doesn't make any sense. I don't see how this could ever lead to what you're thinking it's going to lead to. I think there's so many Christians in our country who who lie in this state of dormancy. And their faith is like this hibernating bear. It's got power, but it's asleep. Because we're sitting around wasting our time trying to figure out God. Trying to make sense of God. Saying, oh, I need some more answers. I need a little more information. I need some more clarity. And instead of actually moving forward in faith how we were created to, we just sit back and say, I'm going to need a little more answers. I need some more information. Abram could have looked at God and said, really, you want me to to do all this and you're not even going to tell me where I'm going. You're not even going to tell me how you're going to accomplish this. Man, don't waste your time trying to make sense out of God's plans. He didn't call you to walk by sight. He called you to walk by faith. Now, that doesn't mean you don't grow in your knowledge of God. That doesn't mean you don't grow in your understanding and your wisdom of God and your relationship. But it does mean that you're not designed to be a people who see every single step of the way. Movement is about going forward in faith. Ultimately, we don't know what Abram was thinking. Uh, We know that he went. If I had to guess, you know, because he's a human like me, he's he's a sinner like us, Uh, His first immediate response was probably not, oh, that sounds great. Sounds like a great idea, God. Probably not his immediate response. He probably wrestled with it. Just as he would wrestle with God's call to sacrifice his son. Yet, he moved in faith. Identity rooted in God. Faith rooted in his plan. So, let's transition this to, to application. Applying the calling. Last week, Lyle gave us great application points. We want to continue in that pattern because 
We want to go through this movement series and, and know as a church how can we uh, collectively be mobilized as a people who are moved by God. Not by our might, not by our power, but by the Spirit. So application, I'll ask in the form of a question. First, where is your identity? Where is your identity? Is it based on what you do or who you are in Christ? Is it about what you do or, or is it about who God is? Paul addresses this to the Corinthians, right? In 1 Corinthians 1, 26 through 31, he says, Consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many of you were powerful. Not many of you were of noble birth. Thanks for the encouragement, Paul, and that reminder. But God, verse 27, but God chose. He chose. He intentionally set it up this way. He intentionally started with this plan that looked like nothing could ever come from it. He didn't get left with the rejects. He didn't choose or settle for those who were left over. He found the weak. He found the least likely and he chose. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are. Why? Verse 29, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. God has set the stage to look like it is absolutely impossible, and that's the point. So that when we look back, we don't see our might. We don't see our power. We see the hand of God, which gives you faith to walk forward by the hand of God in faith. His past promises are evidence for his future promises. And then in verse 30, he says... Because of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness, sanctification, redemption, so that as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. You don't have to go and work for your righteousness. You don't have to go and find your redemption. It is applied to you in Christ. You don't have to work for that identity. You work from that identity. Secondly, application. Is your yes on the table? Is your yes on the table? I'm not asking you if you believe in God. I'm not asking you if you've trusted Christ as your Savior. I'm asking is your whole yes on the table? Some of us think we put our yes on the table. I thought I had my yes on the table at one time. But really it was my terms and conditions. Right? Some of us just put our terms and conditions on the table. God, I will serve you. I believe in you. I love you. I'll do whatever you ask. As long as it's about, you know... Within these parameters, number one, don't send me to another country, right? It's like the one we lead with. I tried this. God ripped them up. I said, I don't ever want to work in a church. I don't want to go to seminary. I don't want to teach the Bible. But God brought me low. He humbled me so that I would put my whole yes on the table. When I look at someone in Scripture who really put their whole yes on the table, I think of Timothy. Paul encountered Timothy or met Timothy in Acts 16. And he, he liked Timothy. He said, why don't you come with me? Well, Timothy said, okay, I'll do that. But he did more than that. Timothy decided as a young man he would get circumcised. Paul had already made it clear, you don't need to do this. This is not a matter of salvation. Uh, it's not a requirement for the faith. But Timothy, even in his, uh, even in his youth, said, I, I'm going to get circumcised. Why? Because he wanted to put his whole yes on the table. He didn't want to be a stumbling block to anybody that he was going to go encounter for the gospel. He was ready to forfeit his rights, abandon his preferences, and put his whole yes on the table for the sake of ministering to others for the gospel. He didn't want to be a wedge. He wanted to be a bridge to reach others. So he put his whole yes on the table. Is our yes on the table. Last one, and I'll I'll say it in the form of a statement, not a question. You can't talk about Abraham without talking about faith, right? Right? So from here on out, we go in faith. We follow in faith. Hebrews 11 highlights this, right? Hebrews 11, 8 through 12. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out, not knowing where he was going. By faith, he went to live in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise, For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. Right? That's what faith does. It focuses you on the promise. 
And for us, we can look back at the Old Testament and forward to the New Testament. We've got promises surrounding us. Your faith fixates on those promises. That's how we move forward. By faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive, even when she was past the age, since she considered him faithful who had promised. In verse 12 here, this is the summary. It's the summary verse for this morning. Therefore, from one man, and him as good as dead, were born descendants as many as the stars of heaven and as many as the innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. You talk about an epic story. You talk about a small beginning. One man and him as good as dead. A woman who can't get pregnant. That's how God chose to start this story of producing a family that would number the stars in heaven. I grew up singing the song, Father Abraham had many sons. Had many sons had Father Abraham. Never really understood what I was singing about. But... I do now. It goes on to say, I am one of them. And so are you. We are. We are results of that promise. You are a testimony to this promise. And the story is not over. We have not arrived. The narrative continues. That's why we go and live on mission. That's why we go and live as disciples who are intentional. But church, you don't have to go do it to gain approval or to gain a status. You do it because you're approved. You do it from your status as son and daughter of the king. Go and walk in that identity and obey the directional calling that he's placed on your life, okay? Let's pray together, Bailey. Father, we're so grateful that, uh, Lord, you don't send us out in our own strength. Lord, we're grateful that you don't ask us to go and accomplish your plan, but, but rather you use us to be ministers of reconciliation. Father, help us to be a people who submit to that calling and surrender ourselves to that call and place our identity in you so that we can go and work from that identity and not for that identity. Father, I pray that in this moment as we, as we respond that you would, God, soften our hearts to your spirit or as you speak your truth. I pray that there would be people in here who respond to that directional calling and they they lay down those excuses or they throw off those weights that have been holding them back. God, I pray you'd set them free now and you'd give them eyes to see that there is so much freedom on the other side when we walk in faith and we walk in dependence. God, sometimes we we, we pray for clarity. We pray for clarity and clarity's not bad, but God, this morning I want to pray for courage. I pray for courage to move forward even when we don't see what's beyond the next step. God, give us courage as a, as a congregation to move forward in faith, to move forward in the identity of child of God. Lord, we love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.